Hear the word of the Lord this evening. Psalm 39 verses 4 to 6. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. Psalm 49 Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all you who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from my heart will give understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? No man can redeem the life of another or give God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that wise men die, the foolish and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations. Though they had named lands after themselves, but man, despite his riches, does not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are destined for the grave, and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when a man gets rich. When the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Though while he lived he counted himself blessed, and men praise you when you prosper, he will join the generation of his fathers who will never see the light of life. Psalm 90 verses 1 to 12. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass in the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The Apostle Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, in the series we've been looking at, says in chapter 1, verse 20, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. 
For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. We come in our series in Philippians 1 tonight to look again at verses 19 to 26. And I want to deal tonight with the Christian perspective of death. There are some really big bookstores in the world filled with shelves and shelves of books which really presents a huge, huge challenge to those of us who love books. And nowadays with Amazon Kindle, well, all those books are there for us to have access to. But if you visit these bookstores, you will usually find shelves full of different self-help books or how-to books by best-selling authors all of them giving you a sort of step-by-step -step directions for achieving what they promise on the cover. You don't easily find, however, any of these books entitled How to Die Successfully or The Ultimate Guide to Dying. You find the books that say your best life now, but nothing about your best death. In these verses that we've been considering, Paul uses the word gain to speak about death. But for most people, death is something tragic, something that they go to great lengths and expense to avoid for as long as possible. We tend to avoid thinking or talking about death unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, when the American author William Saroyan <clears throat> was within days of his own death from cancer in 1981, he issued a statement to the Associated Press in which he said, Everybody has got to die, but I always believed an exception would be made in my case. Now what? No doubt he was speaking with his tongue in his cheek, but he is expressing there what we all tend to think, that somehow an exception will be made in my case. A little uh, child uh, once prayed desperately for an answer and she said, Dear God, what is it like when you die? Nobody will tell me. P.S. I just want to know. I don't really want to do it. And Woody Allen has been quoted as saying, It's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. You see, it's unpleasant to think about. And so most people put off thinking about death until it becomes inescapable. It's not a popular or a comfortable subject. But as we saw last time, a person is not ready to live unless they are ready to die. To quote Elizabeth Elliot again, There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. To live properly, to live purposefully, will always have a view of both the certainty of death and the uncertainty of when it will occur. The Apostle Paul, you remember from last week, was very clear and focused on his purpose. The purpose he lived for took eternity into account. He summarizes his purpose in verse 20 where he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. That's Paul's mission statement for life, that what he does with his body, whether in life or in death, will exalt, will magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Show that Christ is magnificent. Demonstrate that he is great and supremely valuable. Remember the way we bring a telescope to someone's eyes to see how great something really is, not the way we look at something small and tiny under a microscope. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now we saw last time that to live Christ or live in Christ means being in a relationship or a union with Jesus in which he is our all in all. 
To live Christ means to do what Philippians 3 tells us to do, to count everything as lost now in this life in comparison to the value of gaining Christ. It means cherishing Christ, prizing Christ, treasuring Christ. It means keeping Jesus at the hub of the, the wheel of my life. It's all about Christ. The Muslim will never say, for me to live is, is Muhammad. The Buddhist will never say, for me to live is Krishna or Buddha. The Hindu will never say, to live is Krishna. They all look to their rules and their regulations, their laws of outward morality. They look to the temples or the mosque visits and doing all their prescribed rites. That's what they live for. But the Christian looks away from herself, away from all her good works, and looks to Jesus Christ alone. He alone is our righteousness. He is our very life. So that's what we considered when we looked at to live as Christ. Then we saw that dying is gain. If we've sought to live Christ, then dying will be gain because we get Christ. We'll be with him. We can't lose. Do you remember we saw? It's a win-win position. Because if we live, we go on glorifying Christ and we get to bring a few others along with us. But if we die, well, then we graduate to the, to the most ultimate human experience. We get to glorify and enjoy Christ forever and ever. Infinitely. Without having to worry about fighting sin and the devil anymore. We'll be out of reach of all that frustrates us. We'll be beholding the beauty of the Lord Jesus in an ever-expanding, ever-intensifying, ever-accelerating experience of total joy in Him forever and ever. And that's because God is infinite. And we'll never get to the end of discovering and enjoying more and more and more about God. So to live is Christ, but to die is Gain! Gain! Now, for the next few weeks, I want to focus a little bit on the subject of dying. On the Christian perspective of death. And tonight we want to look at what it means to live with eternity in view. Next week I want to consider what happens to us when we die. What does the scripture teach? What happens to us when we die? And then after that, I want to look at how we can minister to the bereaved, to those who are left behind when someone dies. And I hope to show you that considering death is not a morbid thing. I hope to show you that it is one of the most important subjects for the living to focus on. So let's start tonight by looking at what it means to live with eternity in view. You cannot live the Christian life properly unless you understand the Christian perspective on death. Now our view of death must be based on the truthfulness of God's revelation about it in his word and not on the speculations of people. Martin Luther once said, even in the best of health, we should have death always before our eyes so that, we will not ex so that we will not expect to remain on this earth forever, but that we'll have one foot in the air, so to speak. Jonathan Edwards, as a young man, famously wrote down 70 resolutions, um, which he read weekly to keep his life focused. And resolution number nine was, resolved to think much on all occasions of my dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. The Puritan preacher Richard Baxter, who lived with chronic bodily illness for 56 years before his death at age 76, said, I preach as though I never should preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. Yes, living with eternity in view, as though each day could be our last, that would take us to stand before our master is not a morbid thing. It is vital for God's children if we want to keep our focus in life. 
You see, measured in the light of eternity, what really counts, what really matters, will stand out clearly. So my task tonight is to begin to disillusion you. And by that I mean to unillusion you about life and death. To live with an illusion is dangerous. In fact, it can be psychotic. So what we want to be is to be those who live without illusions, those who are disillusioned, those who live in the light of reality. Our studies over the next few weeks will not be in vain if through them we gain Paul's perspective, God's perspective through Paul in the scriptures on life and death. So I ask you now, Lord Jesus, that you will please come and be with us as we study this very important subject and that you will be the teacher to our hearts tonight. In your name, Amen. Well, what does the Bible teach about death? What does the Bible teach about death? First of all, the cause of it. The Bible clearly teaches that God made man and then he looked at everything he'd made and he said it is very good. And then he placed man in a garden and he gave him everything good to eat. He said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But he placed one restriction on man's freedom. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you shall surely die. Die. And we all know that man disobeyed God. And so, as Romans 5.12 says, Therefore sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. The cause of it. The Bible clearly teaches us that death is certain. Because of our disobedience and our sin, death is certain. We all must die unless the Lord comes back again before that. There is an unchangeable law of death under which all people must be found. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 in the Old King James puts it this way. It is appointed unto man once to die and thereafter the judgment. Or as the NIV puts it, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. This is confirmed, isn't it, by the experience of all the generations who've gone before us. Ever since Abel, who was the first person to die, right up to this moment. And still, death claims victims daily. And we are so much more aware of that at the moment. With every single country on every news station in the world daily announcing the deaths by coronavirus. The grave never says it is enough. And yet we are so slow to learn the lesson. When last have you looked at a photo album? Perhaps some of those really old photos of way back of your grandmother or great-grandmother, those black and white photos, those sepia-colored photos. Do you realize that they are not here anymore? That they too used to be where you were? And they too thought they would live forever. And yet the evidence is in the photo album or in our history books. Where's Julius Caesar? Where's Alexander the Great? Where is great King Nero? They're all gone. Thomas Boston, and I'm going to be quoting a lot from him tonight, said, Death is an inexorable, irresistible messenger. That is, it is an unrelenting, unstopping, unstoppable, inescapable messenger who cannot be diverted from executing his orders by the force of the mighty, the bribes of the rich, or the entreaties of the poor. 
It doesn't reverence the hoary head, and the hoary word hoary just means white or grey head. In other words, it doesn't reverence the old, and neither does it pity the harmless babe. The bold and daring cannot outbrave it, nor can the faint-hearted obtain a discharge in this war. Ladies, the statistics are in. One out of one persons will die. All 100% of us will die. Death is certain. Thirdly, death is imminent. And by imminent, I mean impending or close or near. Let's just think for a moment about how Im imminent death is for all of us. The scriptures teach us <clears throat> that our bodies are dust. Dust you are. And to dust you will return, Genesis 3 verse 19. Now, this in itself should be a constant reminder to us of just how fragile our lives are. Paul says that our mortal bodies are like a tent or like clay, a clay pot in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. Our lives are brittle, they're temporary, they are easily broken and destroyed. If we consider just how marvelously our bodies are made and put together, how intricately everything works together, how everything needs to be balanced just right for us to be healthy, well then it's, it's a real wonder that any of us are as healthy as we are. If we just consider for a moment how many doors uh, disease and death has to enter our bodies every day through every pore with every breath we take in spite of all our masks <laughs> then the very fact that we are alive should astonish us far more than the fact that we are dead or that there is death every day our bodies fight over a myriad of possible causes of disease and death that we don't even know about and that could take our lives instantly if we were not kept alive by God. And so, as Thomas Boston puts it, we should think it more strange to see dust walking up and down on top of dust than to see dust lying down in the dust. Disease and illness are really just God's warning signals. Remember, ladies, those trumpet judgments from Revelation. They are God's warning signals to us to prepare for the one great certainty of life, which is death. So our bodies are but dust, but scripture also teaches us that our lives are vain or empty or fleeting. Our lives are here today and gone tomorrow. It is like grass which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Isaiah 46 to 8, all men are like grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And, and our lives are a vanity, they're fleeting, because no matter how much we achieve or build up or store up during our lifetime, we have to leave it all behind to those who follow us who will not even appreciate the things that we have. Psalm 39.6, we read it earlier. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth not knowing who will get it. And you remember the parable of the rich fool who stored things up in his barn and then wanted to take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry for you've stored up enough security for yourself for a lifetime. And then in the parable we read, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Just think through the various stages of life. As children, we are helpless and we're totally dependent on our parents to, to teach us and raise us. 
As young people, we are often rash and foolish and inconsiderate and self-centered and, and chasing after pleasures that will soon disappear. But before we know it, youth is gone. And we find ourselves in middle age with all of its cares and its concerns. And then, almost as though it were yesterday, comes old age with its own measure of infirmities and weakness and sorrow. One pastor says, The tenderest memories we have, the greatest actions we perform, the greatest achievements we have made, every letter behind our names, all the love in our hearts will one day be erased and become extinct. And the point is that much of what we keep ourselves busy with is vanity. It is emptiness in the final analysis. But more than that, not everyone is even guaranteed old age either because death carries off some people in the bud of childhood. Others are carried off in the blossom of youth. Still others, when they begin to mature and grow fruit, relatively few are left until they are bent over like the full-grown ripe wheat of old age. So scripture teaches us that our lives are vain, empty, and fleeting. Thirdly, it teaches us that our lives are short. Look at scripture and how it speaks of a man's lifespan in comparison to eternity. In Psalm 90, which we also read, verse 10, it speaks of our lives in terms of years. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. But Job 14 and verse 5 speaks in terms of our lives, in terms of months, as though to reckon our lives in terms of years would be too long. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. And even that is too much to reckon our lives with. Job 14.1 speaks of days. Man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. In fact, Scripture brings it even further down to speak of our lives in terms of a moment. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, even though it lasts a whole life long, it is still but for a moment in comparison to eternity. Our lives are short. And then think of the various pictures that Scripture uses to represent our lives. We saw that we are like grass, <laughs> which is here today and gone tomorrow, or like the flower of the field. Now notice not a garden flower, but the flower of the field, the flower that can be easily trampled on at any moment by the cattle or the sheep grazing in the field. And so our lives are liable to a thousand accidents every day, any one of which could cut us off at any moment unless God's hand stays there. We are also told that our lives are compared to a passing shadow, a passing shadow, Job 14.2. He, that is man, springs up like a flower and withers away like a fleeting shadow he does not endure. Have you ever watched how quickly the shadow moves across the garden, for example? Especially now in winter. And then, that's a picture for us, a vivid picture for us of just how fleeting and short life is. Our lives in James 4 verse 14 are compared to a vapour or a mist, something we know all about here in Gulfus Bay. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And we are said to be like a puff of wind in Psalm 78 verse 39. God remembered the day, that's the Israelites, 
were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return, a puff of wind. Paul says we are said to be dwelling in a tent in 2 Corinthians 5, 1. And one more in Job 7, 6 and in Isaiah 38, verse 12, our lives are compared to a weaver's shuttle. You can picture a weaver sitting in front of his loom and you can picture him moving his shuttle across the web. The movements are quick and before long the rug is finished and it's cut from the loom. Is the penny dropping? We don't think in these terms too often, do we? We all tend to live as though tomorrow is guaranteed us. And so consequently, we don't spend enough time considering eternity and living in the light of it. So what should living in the light of eternity then do for us? In his famous Christmas story, Charles Dickens drives home the truth of what we've been considering and shows the effect that it should have on us. Do you remember old Ebenezer Scrooge who lived only with this world in sight? Do you remember how his dead friend Marley tried to warn him but his ears stayed closed until he's taken into his future by the ghost of Christmas future to his appointment with death. His present life is then totally transformed by the consideration of that one inescapable appointment with death. So what should a consideration of these things do for us? First of all, it is a mirror in which to see the vanity of this world, the emptiness of this world and earthly things. All the things of this world and those things that people value so much and set their hearts upon are passing away. They are but a clay God that's going to fall and crack and be broken that will disappoint and forsake you at death. So learn the lesson. Don't chase after earthly things. Beware of covetousness as Jesus teaches us in that story of the rich fool in Luke 12. And covetousness is really just wanting more and more of what you don't need and what you have enough of already. This should teach us that these earthly things are temporary and we should not chase after them. And don't set your heart too much either on worldly applause or worldly acclaim either. Look into the grave and consider and be wise. I just said earlier, where is Nero? Where is Alexander the Great? Where is Michael Jackson? Where are all these great people now? Listen to the doctrine of death and learn that no matter how tightly you hold on to this world, you will be forced to let go of it eventually. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith, have pierced themselves with many griefs. Thomas Boston again gives this advice. He says, go and lie down in the grass. Stretch yourself out to full length in it. And then get up and observe the imprint that you have left in the grass. And you will know how much of this world will be yours at last. This world is a false friend which will leave you in your time of greatest need. 
When you lie on your deathbed, all your friends and relations can't rescue you. And all your money and possessions can't buy you a way out. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, quoted these words a few times in these studies. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father but from the world and the world and its desires are passing away. But the man or woman who does the will of God lives forever. So it is a mirror to see just how empty and fleeting this world and its earthly things are. Secondly, it is an excellent remedy against fretting over your losses and crosses. We learn this from Job, don't we? When Job had lost everything he had, he was able to sit contented in the midst of this loss with this thought. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. When seen in the light of eternity, our losses and our crosses are, as 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, but light and momentary affliction. It's always good to remember in any situation that the situation could have been worse. Because whatever is consumed or taken away from us is, it is still the Lord's grace that we have not been consumed yet. Lamentations 3, 21 to 26. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We are not consumed. All the stuff may go, but we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those who hope for Him. To the one who seeks Him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And therefore, why worry over much about the cares of this world? Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. And if that, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed or dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, unbelievers, run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When you go on a journey, and you have to sleep over, say, for a night at a, at a lodge. And the accommodation is not too wonderful. I remember a few years ago we had a wonderful holiday in Cape Town. We flew down to Cape Town and 
the last stage of our journey, we booked to stay in a place which on the internet looked amazing with a beautiful sea view until we arrived. The place was absolutely horrendous. It was in shambles. There was no sea view. It was part of an old age home, village. There was mold all over the place. And because we'd flown to Cape Town, there, we didn't even have our own bedding. And I tell you, I spent a dreadful first night in that room, sleeping in the really grotty bedding. Now, after that, we were able to clean up a bit and make it a bit more livable, seeing as our ticket home would only be in a week's time. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you're on a journey, even if you have to stay in horrible accommodation for a night or even for a week, you can, make, you can grin and bear it. You can make the most of it. You can clean up and do what you can to make it bearable. Because you know you're not home. Because you know this is just a stopover. It's only for one night. It's only for a week. In the same way, Christian, on the road to eternity, to glory with Christ, don't let it discourage you too much that you have to meet with hardships here in the lodge of this world. You aren't home yet, but you will be soon. Thirdly, living in the light of eternity, thirdly, will keep a healthy check on your sensual and fleshly desires. 1 Peter 2 says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, that is, as sojourners, people passing through this world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. You see, a serious visit with death in the grave will have an amazing effect on suppressing our sinful desires. What kinds of desires? Desires like an excessive care of the body or concern about the body. Now, obviously, we should be concerned about our bodies and do what we need to do. I'm talking here about an excessive care of the body. You see, often the questions of what shall I eat and what shall I drink and what shall I wear are far more important to us and take up far more time in answering than the most important question of all, which is how shall I stand before the Lord? Often we're so busy repairing and renovating the room tent that we leave the immortal occupant within our souls bleeding, neglected and disregarded. If we spent as much time caring for our souls, reading our Bibles, communing with the Lord as we do in front of the mirror, maybe we would be far better prepared for that house appointed for all the living. Other desires like pride, pride concerning our bodily characteristics would also be suppressed. Are you proud of your youth, the blossom of youth? Well, that's futile because your life can be snatched away at any moment. Don't be too proud of how strong you are either because your strength will quickly pass away and before you know it, you won't even be able to turn yourself on your bed and your friends, your grieving friends, will have to carry your body in that coffin to your grave. Are you proud of how healthy you are? Your healthy constitution, as though it's because you are so wise and you have done so much to keep yourself healthy that you are healthy. Well, you know, death doesn't always come after a long sickbed. Are you proud of your beauty, your physical beauty? Well, remember that the change that death makes on the fairest face is so ugly that we bury it far underground, out of sight. Remember Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but the woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Even our finest clothes, all those 
beautiful clothes that we so much like to, to dress up in, ladies, eventually will be exchanged for words. So it will suppress our sinful desires in terms of pride about our bodily characteristics. But then lastly, it will also suppress those lusts of the flesh, those desires, sinful desires of the flesh, the eye that delights in sinful images, the tongue that speaks filth or lies, the ears that listen to evil, the body parts that take part in sin will all be silenced at death. The pleasures that these body parts bring us in this life are fleeting. They're only for a season. And if we do not turn from them, we'll reap for us a harvest, an eternal harvest of sorrow. You see, thinking on death, and more particularly on facing the God of the universe after death, should have a very sobering effect on our passions and desires. We will have to give an account for our lives. Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than have to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. Fourthly, living in the light of eternity, fourthly, will serve as an encouragement to cling to Jesus and to keep serving him, no matter how difficult this life becomes. It will spur us on to keep on keeping on for Christ, to keep on living for Jesus, standing for his truth, whatever we may suffer in, in the process. Because we know that this light momentary affliction is achieving for us a glory that far outweighs it all. It will reduce our fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us the fear of man is a snare. Isaiah 51 puts it this way, verses 12 and 13. Who are you that you fear mortal men, the sons of men who are but grass? But you forget the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, so that you live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor who is bent on destruction. Do you see? Why do you fear mortal men, people who are just grass? More than you fear God, the living God who made them. All those you fear are just jars of clay that can be dashed to pieces at death. Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. A view of eternity will teach us that there is nothing that we can give up for Christ and his gospel that we will not lose the death anyway but that in giving away now for his use will lead to us retaining the benefit of them for all eternity Jesus said everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake and the gospels will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And lastly, living in the light of eternity will also be a strong encouragement for us to prepare for this appointment with death. Remember that as the tree falls, so it lies throughout eternity. In other words, your eternal state will be according to the state in which you find yourself when you die. Death will either open the doors of heaven for you or swing wide the gates of hell to you. 
There are no second chances once we die. The moment our eyes close in death, our eternal destination is sealed. Now tonight, if you are not in Christ, then you can know that for you, death is not the end of your troubles, but only the beginning. Many people think that this life is the hope, but for those outside of Jesus Christ, death will bring them an eternity of uninterrupted, unsoftened suffering, bearing the full extent of God's white heart, righteous wrath, anger against your sin, which you deserve. And to you, I plead tonight, to remember now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow. You are not guaranteed another morning. Now is the day of salvation to turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. And so seal your eternity with him forever. And if you are in Christ this evening, well then you can know for certain that death is gain. It is merely your servant to lead you, to escort you to glory, into the presence of your Saviour, your Bridegroom, and that wedding supper of the Lamb. It means the end of all your toils and cares. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when we get to the end of the way. That was sung by one of the singers with the gaiters that my mother really loved. The toils of the road, ladies, will seem nothing in comparison when we get to the end of the way with glory. This life is the only hell God's children will ever face. It is but a short time that we have to prepare for death. But for most of us, it is true that we have lived far more years than are left to us. We should make the best use of the time that is left to us. In other words, have God's focus and His perspective for our lives. Paul's focus for me to live is Christ and therefore to die is gain. We need to make the best use of our time that is left to us in reaching the lost for Jesus. A view of eternity and of the frailty of our human existence should spur us on to speak to the lost because it's the only way for them to avoid condemnation in death. And it should spur us on to pray fervently and diligently that they would be saved. As Ray Comfort puts it, you may face rejection from those you speak to, but they face an eternity in hell. So it should spur us on with a love for the lost to preach the gospel to them. It should also spur us on in the light of how short our time is to mend our relationships to do all in our power to seek to heal and mend broken relationships, to make right with each other as far as it is in our power to do so. And then thirdly, it should spur us on to pass on a heritage of faith to our children. Our first missionary field and our most important priority is our own children passing on that baton of faith to them. But then we also need to think in terms of other children who haven't had the privilege of a Christian home or the benefit of being raised with Christian values and with the gospel being taught. We need to reach those children too. We mustn't be so short-sighted that we seek only to build a church for today. The children and the young people need to be reached. 
They need to be discipled. What you build into the lives of others, particularly your own children, but anybody else, what you build into their lives of the gospel and of Jesus Christ is the only thing that will survive you and outlast you, perhaps for generations to come. My ladies, Titus chapter 2 has given us that mandate. We've been told to teach the younger women, to disciple them, to love their husbands, to love the Lord, to keep their homes. Everything we do for Lord Jesus Christ in discipling others, in building into their lives, is all that will survive us. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19-20, For what is our hope? our joy or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? What will be our reward? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. So let me end tonight again where I ended last Tuesday evening. What are you living for? Will it outlive you? Only one life, and it's a very short life, as we've seen tonight. And therefore, only what's done for Christ will last. But what's done for Christ will last. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain, God himself promises in his word. Dying is the one thing that none of us gets a practice round with. There's no free trial period with death. We only get to do it once. And then we'll stand before the Lord. So let us prepare to do it well. The only way to die well is to love Christ. So let's labor and let's live each day as though it were our last. May God help us to do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for reminding us again this evening that we are a moment, but you are eternal. We are but dust. You are gloriously infinite. Thank you, Lord Jesus, tonight for the glorious knowledge that we have that if we are in Christ, we are immortal. That even when this body, this tent is put off, that to be absent from the body will be to be present with you, Lord Jesus, forever. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that we will live in the light of eternity, in the light of how short a time we have to spend on this earth to live for you and to, to leave behind a heritage of faithfulness which is all that will outlive us. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that tonight's study will spur us on to think deeply on these things and to make the changes that are necessary in our lives to do this for the glory of your name and for the good of your church. We ask in your name. Amen.